So now we have um, Jeremy Barton. Um, Jeremy, if you want to make your way up to the stage, that'd be wonderful. Um, Jeremy has also been <laughs> um, a repeat guest at Foresight events for quite some time, um, possibly before I was around um, with Foresight, but then you disappeared uh, for a little while um, and you tell us a little bit about what you were up to then and why you're now trying to push for a more open initiative um, as it comes to molecular nanotechnology. Um, in fact, I think you were at Vision Weekend um, in Germany as well this year, and your project or your final funding mechanism proposal was actually the one that won the final prize together with Eric Drexler. So maybe you can share a little bit about what you've been up to since then. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you for the wonderful introduction, Alison. So I think I'm the one right before lunch. Lulu? No, Lulu oh, coming after. You get before lunch. Oh, awesome. We are very great on time, by the way. 20 minutes early. 20 minutes early. I am not going to burn all of that time. Let's get to lunch after one more talk. So Allison's correct. My first Foresight event was probably about 17 years ago. And while I was there, I met some fun members of the crowd who pulled me into a stealth startup doing positional chemistry. We'll talk a little bit about that. Just as a quick reminder though, if this is our vision weekend, the vision of foresight was inspired by the work on replicators and atomic precision manufacturing that Eric Drexler talked about and pushed. That does not, no. anyway. This is a slide Eric used at the Molecular Nanotechnology Workshop that we co-hosted earlier this year. The basic approach though, there are three core ideas to actually change the world. Positional chemistry, this is how the ribosome builds proteins. Molecular machines, this is the functional component of the, the ribosome that acts kinematically to put the molecules in the correct spot. And then self-replication, the system of nanomachines that works together in order to make 10 to the eighth uh, improvements. We've done all of these things in the last 40 years. We have positional chemistry systems. This over here is an example publicly about creating radicals on a surface and using them to do positional chemistry. This is uh, the resolution to the Drexler-Smalley debate, Drexler debate. We have molecular machines. We've had some great talks from William. We're about to get another talk from Lulu Shan. On the topic, we have kinematic control over molecular structures. And we just heard a lovely talk on self-replication. These systems are all working in isolation. I've spent the last 15 years working on positional chemistry. This is what Allison was referring to. I vanished into a private corporate research effort to get atomically precise control over, well, carbon, if you check the patents. However, this is private corporate research and in the beginning of the year, there was a strategic realignment that let off half the team. So that project continues forward, and I'm immensely proud of the work that we've done there, but I don't get to talk about it, and they are being slow on their publication schedule. So for the last year, I've been poking around saying, well, if these are the three things we need to do, what is the current position of molecular machines? Can we get to the point where we can actually bridge these three ideas together? And the answer, of course, is no, otherwise we would have self-replicating nano devices and be in full control of the material structure of our universe. But that doesn't mean it's impossible to get there. In poking around, I found only a couple places that come anywhere close. They are the uh, Center for Bits and Atoms and the Wies Institute, both of which have a lot of other things on their plate. So in the interest of actually pushing this forward in a focused, coordinated way, I have just founded the Nanodynamics Institute. Literally just founded it. I got the tax ID number last week. So unlike the people who've been talking before, I do not have decades of work or years of work in a lab that I get to talk about. I just get to focus on the problems to solve. So first, the NDI. Uh, basically, our job is just to try and bridge these gaps, give us a focused place to pull together the people and the effort necessary to actually construct productive nanomachines in a way that doesn't focus almost entirely on biology. The general approach, we're going with systems engineering. We'll use uh, proven technology wherever possible. I don't need to read the slide to you. 
We spent the last year pulling together a model-based systems engineering roadmap of the work that everybody does that touches on this area. That roadmap is not done. It will be a continuous process, but we will be releasing those roadmaps on a public basis starting sometime probably the middle of next year. The course of this, there is an obvious pathway to construct atomically precise machines. You make the parts, you put them together, you control your machines, you use that to construct a system of replicating nanomachines and then reprogram those nanomachines to construct product. Hopefully I'm preaching to the choir. The area where I'm seeing a lot of current challenges in bridging the gap to something like what Neil was talking about but with nanomachines is high bandwidth control of those nanomachines. DNA origami is amazing, but you put almost all of your control parameters in at the beginning, and then you can tune temperature, or you can tune adding a new DNA displacement strand in order to actually manipulate the things once they're built. And those are slow processes, and the yield's not always great. Probably hear lots of other ways of controlling them, but these are the ones that are most familiar. I think we need to get a different set of actuation controls. I think we need electrical control of our nanomachines. Now, this is my personal intuition speaking. This isn't the fundamental result of the NDI road mapping process. This is just something I get to talk about here. NDI will be building three parallel pathways to get to productive nanomachines and pursuing them in parallel. But coming back to my opinions, fundamentally, I think chemical actuation is too slow. And I think optical actuation, you have challenges getting lots of orthogonal signals in. But with electrical actuation and some of the more recent developments in constructing very precise wires that come out of the quantum you know, atomically precise manufacturing community, you can get a lot of signals into a pretty small volume. And with electrostatic actuation of molecules, you can get pretty high uh, rates of motion. And finally, with sensors from those same systems, particularly field effect transistors and single electron transistors, you can get a pretty good feedback of the state of your system, which gives you eyes and hands at the nanoscale that we need to construct systems. Fundamentally, I want to build something like this, all right? Structured out of DNA origami or artificial proteins to get the atomically precise components, but then interfaced and controlled on a chip this would be a delta manipulator nanorobotic system designed to put together other systems. If we're self-assembling everything, we're always putting in all the information at the beginning. If we have the ability to construct parts, take modular parts and put them together, Allison is throwing a reindeer at me. This is a massive interdisciplinary project. You need biologists, nanofabrication engineers, materials scientists, chemists, electrical engineers, mechanical and control engineers, and software integration experts. This is beyond the scope of what you're gonna get in an academic lab. So, we're looking for help. And for that, I open for questions. Thank you. Questions, comments, Kathleen. Thanks so much, uh, Jeremy. Always a pleasure to see you talk. So very briefly, we talked before about uh, trying to basically read and uh, write to the brain, or just read from the brain using nanomachines. Can you tell us a little bit how fantastical that is, and if it's doable, and can we revive nano dust or neural dust type of technologies? I think that molecular nanotech, with the kind of capabilities that we're talking about eventually reaching through a pathway like this gives us better tools to address every challenge that foresight looks like, including whole brain emulation and uh, BCIs. Uh, Caitlin, you and I have talked briefly about multiplexed chemical sensing in brains or looking at um, afferent fields. I think if you can put a billion biosensors throughout your entire body that are specifically designed to look at the biochemical or field configuration that are all clocked and can get you that terabytes of data per second as output, we can really, really advance all of our biological systems. Doing that, however, requires us to run pretty far down a pathway like this. But yeah, I think this gives us tools to address every one of Foresight's focus goals. Well, I love your final piece of the slide that says, do the work. 
<laughs> and that's the thing. We have to do the work. And right now, we're pretty siloed. We need to get people together. All right. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Thank <laughs> you.